I've, I've been thinking about this since you texted me this. And the only person I can think of is somebody who's dead. Charlie Russell. Charlie freaking Russell is who I would pick. It's a terrible answer. An absolute terrible <laughs> answer. <laughs> I didn't know. I was like, that's the first guy that came to my mind. I was like, cool. He's the most Montanan guy I could think of is Charlie Russell. I'm gonna put I'm gonna pick Charlie Russell. <laughs> Jeez. That's terrible, man. Manhattan Bank has been serving the Gallatin Valley since 1905. Started by local farmers in order to help grow the agriculture industry, Manhattan Bank has since grown into a full-service bank serving the entire valley. With branches in Manhattan, Churchill, Three Forks, and Bozeman, you're never far from your local bank. As banks are consolidating and changing, Manhattan Bank sets themselves apart through consistency and a small-town banking feel. Come see why we have been in the valley for well over 100 years. Stop by the new building in Bozeman, see Justin Skillman and Tyler Dosher for your business banking, and Brad Wimmer for your home loans. Go Cats! Member FDIC. Welcome everybody to the r r Cat Cats, a fan-based podcast focusing on Montana State athletes. We're two dudes named Ryan from the state of Washington talking about our dear Montana State. We hope you enjoy it. Welcome back, Bobcat fans. Thanks for joining us on another episode of the r r Cat Cast. We are the Ryans of the r r the Montana State affiliate of the Big Sky Podcast Network. We are brought to you by our sweet sponsor, Manhattan Bank, taking care of all your banking needs in the Gallatin Valley. Four locations, Bozeman, Churchill, Manhattan, and Three Forks. We are here to talk Cat Grizz. It is Cat Grizz Week. The biggest, longest, most awesome, everything week you can put on paper, in your head, on the screen, on the airwaves. It's all. It's encompassing. It is omnipresent. It is effervescent. You can smell it in the air. Cat Grizz Week. Thorny. Ubiquitous. That's the word. It is ubiquitous. It is everywhere all at once. It's in your brain. It's in your sleep. It's in your body. I can't get rid of it, man. It's I can't stop thinking about cat grizz. Yeah, no matter how much I wash wash my beard, it's still it's just hanging out in there. And uh, what do you got a thesaur- thesaurus back there? Jeez, <laughs> went on a rant. You did. I like it. it. Feeling the vim. Got the vim. <laughs> I'm drinking some vim. Man, yeah, it feels good, man. That's a you did it, man. You nailed it. Episode over. <laughs> All right, go cats. Go, go cats, man. Cat grizz. Cat grizz. There it is. It is time. Game day is going to be there, man. Just absolute insanity. We're not, man, we're we're just kind of just going off the rockers already right this, but I'm, you know, I'm just so excited about this, man. Game day is going to be in Bozeman. It's Cat Grizz week. It's huge. I just, I'm excited. I'm excited. It is unreal. How many people texted you today? Well, you're going to Bozeman, right? Yeah, do the R and R. You must be going to Bozeman. <laughs> yeah, especially when uh, they found out game days. Like, oh, you're coming to Bozeman because game day is here, right? I'm like, uh, yeah, no, no, can't. It's not going to happen for us. Is it because we're kind of holding out for a semifinal again, or maybe a national championship? I think that's what I've been telling myself in my head. Well, I have some things that I want to get into. Why? Well, I why I can't go, but uh, okay. Um. I probably wouldn't have gone even if I was free, if I had no obligations. Yeah, it, it's, it is a logistical, I don't know, not a nightmare, but it is tough to get over there and tough to arrange all the things you need to arrange in order to just sustain life in <laughs> Bozeman during Cat Grizz. <laughs> I, do, I just don't love being in the stadium for Cat Grizz. As much as other really? games, honestly. Yeah, there's just something about it. It's just like too intense. There's too much like cheering against your team in your own home stadium. There's just, I don't know, if you sit next to some obnoxious fans, which is too many things that can go wrong. I know it's a lot of fun things inter- inter- intermingling with some like Grizz fans and tailgates and all that stuff. But as a person who's not overly social, um, I don't know. It's not my favorite game to go to. 
That's that's kind of what I was thinking about too. Is like, why don't I necessarily enjoy the cat grizz as much as I used to? Is think I think I'm becoming more of an introvert as I get older. I was never an extrovert to begin with, and so large crowds, I find myself just reclusing from that. Mm. But hey, you know it is what it is. You and I need to break uh, break the streak of going to a bobcat game where we lose. <laughs> it feels like we're on. A two-game losing streak. So yeah. We got to choose wisely. <laughs> we do. Yeah. Yeah. Playoffs. If there's a playoff game in Bozeman, yeah. I, I will definitely try and get back. Tickets are usually easier to to come by for those kinds of things. Yeah. That's, that was not to say I think we're going to lose this game. I'm just saying we just got to choose wisely. Correct. Correct. Don't read into it, listeners. Gosh. Yeah. No hate mail. All right. Well, thanks, listeners, for joining us. <laughs> if you... I mean, this might be the very first time you listen to Ryan and Ryan. We are two dads, two fans. We we run a fan based podcast for Montana State Athletics, and so this is a big week for us. And we're happy that you've joined us. And we're going to talk about uh, the polls today. So let's do a little show rundown. We'll get into the stats FCS poll and also our Big Sky Power rankings that uh, we both crafted at least i did i don't know about you thorny i was too busy didn't do it <laughs> two weeks in a row i saw the look Slipping. i saw the look on your face I'm like, Ooh. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. all right so we'll talk about that we'll get into brent vegan's presser also i watched a handful of seniors i got on the youtube today and they were uh giving their thoughts on cat grizz and game day and whatnot we'll talk about those guys and then we're just going to break down the Cat Grizz game. Uh, we gave our thoughts on the Cal Poly game and the instant reaction show that we released this morning. But today's all about Cat Grizz. Yep. Got that game out of the way. Excited to focus solely on Cat Grizz. All right, man. Cool. Well, first of all, let's talk about what's in our Golden Coolie. What's in your Golden Coolie? Foley, we've had this beer on here before. Did we ever learn how to actually pronounce this? The lesion. Is it a lesion? Is that, you, you sure that's correct? Yeah, it's a lesion. The lesion. I've heard other people, I thought I heard it pronounced differently when I watched a commercial or something. Anyway, I got their Bifrost Winter Ale. They're lively winter seasonal, bold with citrus and earthy hops and balanced with a smooth malt character. Pour carefully. It is unfiltered and may contain sediment. I don't know. It's felt like a good beer. Uh, we pretty much had the first frost here this week. It's getting cold for the first time, really. I saw this in the store, and I'm like, yeah, it's winter. It's that time, man. Cat Grizz just feels like winter to me. I got a Bifrost winter ale. And that's what I'm enjoying here tonight. It's pretty tasty. I recommend it. Yeah, I like the unfiltered profile. That looks good, man. I had. I don't think I've ever seen a beer like that I don't that think I've before. seen it either. It's good. Wow. All right. Well, I have a classic for Ryan Foley, and it is not a Rainier. It is the Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. There you go. Man, that guy right there. Top three beers of my life. Now, did you drink this in 2019 before Cat Chris? I think I did. <laughs> I remember it because I remember giving you like a... Commenting on like, hey, that's like a celebration beer of yours. Are you celebrating too early here? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that was Cat Grizz 2019, so I don't know if you had that in mind when you picked it out, but uh, you know, I'm going to go ahead and assume that's a good sign. I'll take what I can get right now. I did not have it in mind when I picked it out, and I didn't know I was going to pick it out, although when I was driving home, I thought about just that, and I was like, man, maybe that's a sign. There maybe it's a sign. All right. Well, cheers, man. Cheers. And let's all just uh, take a moment to soak in the season that has been so far. What a great season. And, and, you know, here's to continuing on our winning ways and into the playoffs. So cheers, Bobcat fans. Take a sip of your, your beer, your wine, your whiskey, your LaCroix, your tea. Cheers. Nice. I'm almost done with this thing. I'm too, I'm too excited. <laughs> Granted, we, you know, we, we talked for 15 minutes before we start recording, but it's going down quick. What, what is your plan for Cat Grace? What are you going to do? Well, now that game day is involved, I'm pretty much just going to try and block off the entire day to watch game day. 
And then uh, what, well, I don't even know the hours for game day. And I don't even know the time of kickoff for Cat Grizz. I never know time of kickoff until basically game day. But yeah, my plan is to basically just hang around all day, make some food, watch some football, watch some other football games until the game's on. And just trying to try and be alone as much as possible uh, without having to do any other responsibilities. Is Cat Grizz underrated, proper, 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 hmm, I can't see that word, properly rated <laughs> or overrated? Properly rated. Properly there. I still can't see it. Anyways, I'm going to stop trying. <laughs> yeah, I think it's exactly where it needs to be, man. It's a historic rivalry. I think it's one of the best rivalries in the country at any level. I think it's exactly where it is appreciated, at least uh, locally, within those who root for the teams. I think it's exactly where it should be. If not under. Big game. Nationally, it's underrated. Think so? Yeah. Absolutely. I still think he's properly rated. That's why I'm so excited for game day, because I think it's going to showcase the rivalry to people who maybe not be familiar with it at all. That's why I'm excited for game day to be coming to Bozeman. Yeah, that's going to be such a spotlight for the Bozeman community, the game in, in large. And just, I'm just excited to see like the whole, the whole nation will see our university. Yeah. Not that Bozeman needs any more publicity. In that way, but it's good publicity. It's good publicity, man. And uh, yeah, spotlight on the university, which is continuing to grow. And if you and I ever want to fulfill our, you know, sort of dreams of ever seeing the Bobcats go FBS, this is a good thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do we have Cat Grizz if we go F FBS? Well, yeah, because the Grizz have to come with us. So, yes. Do you think they'll still play it at the end of the season? Yes, I don't think anything changes. Mm -hmm. Unless there's some sort of conference championship know, type situation, but even then, they'll figure out how to do it. Final game. We've bantered back and forth about the timing of the Cat Grizz. I think it'd be more beneficial for both of our teams if it was earlier in the season. It seems like such a such an important game, and then it kind of just wrecks the momentum of both teams going into the playoffs. It could galvanize it, it was weird because last last year could be like well wrong mr foley like look what look what happened last year that was like, like the yeah, outlier that, that is true <laughs> but i think if uh if it was up to me you know the dakota marker game against south dakota state north dakota state is played in like october 15th if you put montana state and montana during that time slot as well you could then craft all the momentum you want out of November. And let's say we played Cal Poly last, you know, going into whatever game we have coming up. It just might make it easier for both teams to have some sort of momentum going into the playoffs. Cause the uh, outcome of this game, yeah, it's kind of devastating for one of the teams. Yeah. I mean, obviously one team has to lose. So no matter how you slice it, you are worse off for your playoff picture than you were. Whereas if one team lost the game, month and a half ago, both teams have a chance to rebuild their resumes and get back on track and get back into the top, whatever you're looking for, you're into the seeding conversation. I mean, there's a possibility that yeah. both teams could be, we could be ranked two and three. And instead of both programs having a top four seed, one's now going to be bumped down to a seven or eight based on one loss at the end of the season. So it is, mm -hmm. it's not ideal for playoff seeding, but it also adds to the craziness that is Cat Grizz. Yeah. So, do you have a, like a, a best cat grizz story? Oh man, you can't just bring something on me like that. Uh, I mean, if I point to any cat grizz story, I probably still my uh, being in the marching band in 2002, sitting in Washington Grizzly Stadium as a member of the Spirit of the West marching band, which is nothing like it is now. It was minuscule back then compared to the the well well oiled machine, large members that they are now. But uh, yeah, I mean that's the one I'm gonna have to point to. For sure. Or, uh, you know, just 2019 with you would be another close, close one. I hold dear in my heart going over there to Spokane and watching the beat down that Bobcat fans have been waiting for for 30 years. That was a, that was a good one too. It was epic. <laughs> I was still nervous in that game, even though we were just kicking so much butt. Yeah. I enjoyed watching 75% of the deal. game with you. 
Because <laughs> the other twenty five percent, you were like walking around the block, like you just left your house. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I remember two thousand four, uh, Corey Smith taking it to the house, Good and point. then. Uh, I don't think my eardrums recovered the rest of the day. I think that might have been the loudest I've ever heard Bobcat Stadium in that split moment. There's a couple games where I remember standing next to Courtney Kramer, Coach Kramer's daughter, and I didn't know who she was. And she was like, yeah, my dad's the head coach. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and I think I was standing next to her during that game. And um, yeah, it was just kind of a crazy game. But... Do you remember we missed the point after? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I want to mention that on the pod before. Yep. It was like, oh, no. <laughs> but we ended up winning that game. The whole Lule years, man, those were some fun cat grays. Yeah, I mean, they were he for- was such a formative awesome years for leader. Us. Oh, yeah, absolutely. He was one the best leader. And that's what I like seeing a little bit about telling me a lot because I think it's some of those same intangibles. But yeah, Ta- Travis Lule. Penultimate Bobcat, penultimate Grizz competitor. All right, man. Well, we waxed on a little bit about some memories. Let's get back on track. Let's talk about the polls Yeah, that came out. <laughs> I told you this, last... this episode would be all over the place. I told you it would be. Oh, man, I can't help myself. It just brings up so many memories. It's fine, man. Right? We're having fun. That's, we're two fans. There's no script here. There's no radio break that we have to <laughs> make sure that we – get something in before (laughs) oh it's so true it's so true we have we're so lucky to be doing this podcast we got in at the right time we're not qualified to be podcasters i don't know if you've noticed that yeah (laughs) you're stuck with uh, us bobcat nation we just we just haven't stopped that's what (laughs) yeah yep and in fact, uh, you know, okay slight humble brag we've uh you know our, our numbers are up this year we're doing we're doing good so that feels a little bit good to see things kind of improving on our front so thanks everyone for tuning in all year all year it's been a it's been a wild ride and continue to do so absolutely all right the all bowl, right, and switch right? out my own beer <laughs> yeah i know i've got like two or my backup that. my backup is that okay. stupid that that bitter it brown that i'm still trying to <laughs> get through oh. i still have two left. <laughs> still have two left i figured after a good strong winter <laughs> ale it you know, it'll be, it won't taste as <laughs> unpleasant. There it is. All right. Well, let's see. Not much changed on the top three. South Dakota State, Sac State, Montana State. North Dakota State's number four, so they stayed steady. Incarnate Word snuck into n- number five. I haven't watched any Incarnate Word. I've been trying to watch a little bit more, just kind of broad scale FCS on Saturdays. Did you tell me that Incarnate Word has like some stud quarterback again? Yeah, Lindsey Scott Jr. I think is his name. He's like blowing away whatever Cam Ward did last year. He's better in like every single category. Wow. Which is absurd. Man. Yeah. It is Talk absurd. about a program that went from basically just a startup into kind of a rocket, right? So... I mean, they haven't really been into a semifinal. I think a kind of word might have been in the quarterfinals with us, like in Choke's 2018 season. It might have been 2019 season. Probably right. I said that. Anyways. Um, Sorry, I was looking up Lindsey Scott stats. <laughs> <laughs> I was curious. All right. I did watch a little bit of Holy Cross. I was interested in those guys. Those guys come in at number six. One thing I would say... They're ten and no. They they look good, Ryan. But when you would picture the Bobcats next to them, I don't think they hold a match. It's just mainly the size. Yeah, when you look at the lines, the trenches. I think Montana State's got them in in spades there. No, you you watch a lot of those kinds of games, uh, the Holy Cross, the Fordhams, those type of programs, and you see like why they're good because they're f- good football teams. But it's like that just, they just don't look like a Division One build. And mm-hmm. it's, it's like, you know, I mean, maybe they'll beat us. Maybe not. That doesn't mean everything off the bus guys, as they say, doesn't mean you're going to win a football game, but they don't look physically the part that most teams in the big sky do, or especially the Missouri Valley football conference. Yeah. Just a big difference right there. I've noticed that as well. 
Weber State comes in at number seven. Mm, putting on down the line, Montana jumped up from number 16 to number 13. So they're coming into the Cat Grizz at number 13. So the Cat Grizz is number three versus number 13. North Dakota is number 16 now. And then our boy, Matt McKay, number 14, Elon. And I think they have a bye this week, on so down. I think they're done. Interesting. Yeah, they're 8-3, and three, so they've played 11 games. They're done. They're just waiting. The State's played 11 games, too. Why would you Why would you put your bye at the very end? It just seems really weird. It does seem weird. I That's mean, something you choose? Yeah, because now, like, so South Dakota State's going to go, like, three weeks between playing a football game. Mm-hmm. Is that good or bad? That's a long time. Everyone's yep. going to be rusty. It really is. So Idaho dropped down from 15 to 21st. The Idaho loss to Davis was bad. I, don't, I mean, it could really hurt them. It will, it's bad for Idaho, but I've been telling you, man, you see Davis. They're on a tear. Yeah. I think that they have a good chance of beating Sack on Saturday. What yeah, time is that so, game? That's probably a night is. game, I imagine. So that would be a nightcap after the Cats dismantle the Grizz. <laughs> Yeah, I don't do that kind of stuff on here. You're looking at me like I just <laughs> jinxed us. Just don't know. What are you doing, Thorny? No, I like it, man. But uh, speaking of Davis, they came into the top 25 Yeah, after we knocked them out. So that's two so, top 25 wins on the Bobcats resume at the moment. That's why you know UC Davis winning is good for multiple reasons. Because it just helps our resume look better, number cell. one. But yeah, keeps us a, a chance to win the title outright as well buy or sell the win over davis is a better win than the win over weber i'll sell that i still think the, the weber win is a bigger one although uc davis might be a better team than weber at this time although uc davis did lose to weber it's hard to say i, I still think weber is a better a better win i'm gonna go opposite i'm gonna say i'm gonna buy the davis over a weber I think Davis is just an overall better team. But you didn't know that at the time. I think, we should, we should I think Montana Davis. State win against Davis is probably our most complete win of the season. Well, that's true. That is absolutely true. That was their best performance of the year. That I'm not going to argue Who's their quarterback during that time? It was Miles Hastings still. No, who was the Bobcats quarterback? Oh, yeah, that was uh, Mr. Sean Chambers. Stem to stern on that one. Yep. 200 yards passing, 200 yards rushing. I remember it like it was yesterday. <laughs> Not that I'm pining for Sean Chambers. I'm just saying that was a very fun thing to watch as a fan. I am. I'm pining for some Sean. He could be the X factor in this game. And he should play. I mean, I guess uh, Brent Vigan, we'll get into the press conference here. We might as well just get right into it, whatever. Press conference, Sean Chambers is possibly going to play. Are you throwing your hands up at me fully? What are you doing over there? I can never read your body language. Got the power polls. Okay. I voted. I went back. And I didn't vote. So I that's I why voted. I just wanted to plow through it. All right. What do you got? Okay. I put SAC <laughs> first, MSU second, Weaver third, UC Davis fourth, the Grizzlies fifth, Idaho sixth, and PSU, Portland State seventh, Northern Colorado. I bumped them up way up. Uh, Northern Arizona, Eastern, Idaho State, Cal Poly. So you pretty much just mimic the uh, the standings almost to a T. Yeah, it kind of went chalk a little bit. There wasn't much that I would change. I mean, I put Idaho number one last week, and I dropped them all the way down to number six. So I would have kept Sac State uh, number one, man. They haven't shown me any reason to bump them out of the number one. No one else, no one else has looked that much better than them. I would have gone probably exactly the same as you on that one. I'm looking at it. I'm just like nodding in agreement. Yeah. Sack number three in the defense in the big sky as well. Sneaky. I was looking at some. Re- I know, right? Some sneaky defense. You don't think about them as a defensive team. No, the knock on them there the whole year is that they've been like vulnerable, especially like in the passing defense. But here they are probably better defensively than the Bobcats are. But people are talking about the Bobcat yeah. defense too. So it's not like it's one discussion only. But uh, yeah, sneakily good defense. I mean, Sack's. Potentially uh, one of the more complete teams in the league. Not the best defense, but when you, we when you look at some of all the parts, like it might be the highest. It would it be a good matchup. did some sleuthing on 
on like future schedules and then went into Montana to, or MSU Bobcats.com. I started looking at, you know, next next year, the year after, year after. We play Sac State pretty consistently. We just didn't play them this year. Yeah, that's true. We didn't play them last year, did we? It was 2019, the homecoming game that you and I went to where Kevin Thompson <laughs> picked us apart. I think it was the last time we played Sac State. <laughs> You're right. I'm looking at her. Yeah. Didn't play them last year. So we either. played them That's consistently, weird. except for the last two years. <laughs> Three years ago, 2019 homecoming. Yeah, I know. Say the last two seasons we haven't played them, which kind of you know just kind of contradicts your statement. Just giving you a hard time. Ah. All right. All right. Okay. Says. Well, closing that window. Rankings are now in the past. All that matters is Cat Grizz. Cat Grizz, baby. Let's get into the Brent Vegan press conference about said game. All right. I did watch it. I did listen to it. I listened to it via podcast form, and then I watched it on YouTube. Give me your takeaways know, before we get into the injury news. What do you got? Give me your takeaways. He do- He didn't match my enthusiasm that I have for this game, or at least I'm feeling. I mean... Jeff Choate, like he is the spirit animal of Cat Grizz. He's not matching that. And I'm not sure that that bodes well for Montana State. I just, I don't know. Coach Vegan is always going to be just Coach Vegan. He's very calculated, very reserved, very, like he's, like I think you called him Midwestern <laughs> at one point. Just mid, Midwest <laughs> nice is what I think I've called him. Midwest before. nice, there it is. Um, he He had a quote. He says, we don't. Uh, let's see. What did he say? We don't have to do anything out of the ordinary. We just have to play well. That was one of his quotes. And I was like, okay, all right. Uh, Which when I, I asked with. about, yeah, I mean, I, I do, I do as well. We'll get into that. When asked, uh, so kind of the narrative, a couple of the media members were bringing up was like, Hey, you know, everything's the same going into the Cat Grizz as it was last year, as far as record, as far as what's on the line, conference championship, seating, both nine and one. And Coach Vegan says, yeah, but we're different this year. Our makeup and what we rely on is different. 100% true. And you and I texted about that today. We are different this year. Yeah, absolutely different. We are a very different football team, like uh, obviously personnel-wise, but just how everything operates, the play calling, Offensively, obviously the play calling defensively because we have a whole new coordinator. But, uh, you know, we don't just run Isaiah Fonze 30 times in a row and call it a day anymore. So there's a, there's a lot more to this team. There's a lot more intangibles on offense. Like last year, I think everyone was kind of just feeling like the decline of the offense. Matt McKay and it all just came, came to a head in Cat Grizz. Like I'm at just as confident. I've been confident all year in this offense and – Nothing has changed at all. If anything, the offense has gotten better running the football. And then passing in the last couple of weeks has a little worried me a little bit. But other than that, I mean, I think the offense is, you know, I, last year I was worried about the offense. I'm not worried about the offense this year. Seems like our play calling is better. Our game script is better. But also in a weird way that we haven't had to rely on Afonso. And we've had to like go into the to the stable of running backs that we were touting early on and actually play all of them in more than we thought. I think that's kind of a blessing in disguise. And not just running backs, quarterbacks too. Like we saw yeah. what happened last year. Tommy Mallott got worn down maybe, and then whatever, he got injured in the national championship game. And it was a whole different game when Tucker Rova came in. This year, if Tommy Mallott goes down and Cat Grizz, Sean Chambers, if he's healthy, comes in and we are still a damn functional offense in that regard. So it's really, it's, mm. there's been so many guys making so many plays, so many different players stepping up and having like season highs, career highs, the one guy different every single week. And that's what makes the Bobcat so dangerous. All right. Uh, let's talk about some injury stuff real quick before I forget to Isaiah Fonse might be a go. I, I would, if I'm a betting man, I'm saying, yes, he's going. Oh man, I want that to be true, but also, well, let's let's talk about that for a second. So let's say he does go. 
is I I mean that he hasn't he hasn't played football in a long time. Is that the first game you want him coming back to? Is a running back a position That's where you're not, rusty, right? or is running back a position you can just pretty much just get the ball and be, be like you were before the injury? Like no, you don't need to shake off the rust. Like you're going to be Isaiah Fonze right off the bat. It's a good question. It's a good question. I think some of the sauce that we've had at running back has been because we are switching up running backs. We have change of speed, change of body types, change of skill sets. Look back last year, Cat Grizz. Isaiah Fonse was having a lot of trouble, but guess who were they keying in on? Isaiah Fonse. So That's all they had to do. you're right, man. Is 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 this a good is this a good game to bring him back in? I'm not sure. Maybe if we have a fourth quarter lead and we're like just like kicking their butts, put them in there. Yeah. Get them ready. I'm not sure. But anyways, it was brought up in the presser today. He might be a go. Danny, you and Brody, kind of Brody Greeby seem like they're on the same kind of timeline. They might be a go. I doubt they will. I would say oh, Danny I, over Brody. I was in the impression that they were not, they were ruled out. No, he said he's very nondescript on it. He gave it kind of ho hum. Well, we'll see, kind of week to week kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, I don't think, I think, still think they're a week out for both of those guys. It would not hurt them to rest up and just get him back, right? Um, David Alston, he's out for a couple weeks. Hopefully, we could get him back. Hopefully. So, I think that was about it. Coy Steele is going to be back. I didn't know Coy still got hurt again. <laughs> or maybe not. But uh, and, and he also mentioned Sean Chambers is a full goal. Yeah. I mean, it's all positive things. Like, I'm, I'm worried... About the injuries on defense, so those are the things that really concern me. But not a, not a terrible injury report. I mean, Isaiah Fonse is kind of the big one, right? Like if he comes back, but I think Sean Chambers alone is huge news because he is like the other piece of the two quarterback system we've been running, and it takes a lot of pressure off Tommy a lot, and it, he does different things in different ways than Tommy. So if he's back fully healthy, he's been resting for weeks now. That's huge. But can you imagine this offense hope- right now with Tommy Watt, Sean Chambers, Elijah Elliott, Isaiah Fonze, and I mean just that alone, but the the Marquis Johnson and Garrett Coon. It's tough because I kind of want to know what kind of version of Sean Chambers we are going to get. Sean Chambers does well when he is in a rhythm and when he is the guy. When he comes in on spot duty, he's not that great. Unless we use him as as we do traditionally in the red zone and just run him. But that UC Davis game was crafted by the Eastern Washington game that gave him that consistency. Like coming into Cat Grizz, man, that's a nervous setting. I mean, that's a big time setting. Very few players rise up, just randomly just thrust it into that, yeah, that game. Yeah, but he's also, he's played a lot of football. I don't think he's a guy who gets rattled necessarily. Like if the Grizz have to go with their their new quarterback, Daniel Britt or whatever, that's a whole different scenario than a guy like Sean Chambers, who has already played a ton of football this year, has played a ton of football in the FBS. But I don't think they're going to ask Sean Chambers to pass the ball very much at all. And if they do, it's going to be some sort of uh, trickery play, maybe like it was the the Philly special where he threw the ball in the dirt like the first game of the year. Mm. <laughs> My how uh, opinion of Sean Chambers as a passer has changed from that Sean Chambers can't throw the ball at all to Sean Chambers might be the best passer on the team, but uh, I don't think they'll ask him to pass the ball very much in this one. If he does, if when he plays, I think he's going to be, I think he's going to be the the hammer. I hope so, man. But that's the Grizzlies' strength is stopping the run. So what? So what? I think that's the the biggest key to this game is Montana State's ability to run the ball. I agree. If we can't run the ball, I'm not sure we win this game. I I haven't seen enough out of our passing attack, our passing game, the routes we run to give me confidence that Tommy Mullot and company can dissect the Grizzly offense through the air. Grizzly defense. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Those guys too. Yeah. So, I mean, I agree with the vegan on this one. I don't think the Bobcats have to change a whole lot in this game. 
Okay. I think we oh, are yeah. such a dominant running game that we just do what we do and we do it well. Like teams know what we're going to do. Everybody all year has known what the Bobcats are going to do. We've been like creatively, so selectively creative here and there and done a few things different here and there. But by and large, our, our bread and butter has remained unchanged. And my biggest worry for this game is we get too cute and try to do too many things to try and throw the Grizz off guard. And it just bites us in the butt. I'd rather just stick to the guns, yeah. ride the ride the horses that have got us here, the play calling, the the scheme, everything that's got us to this point. Just keep doing that and see if the Grizz stop it, then maybe dig into the well a little bit. But don't come out and be cute right off the bat. You know, test the Grizz defense with what we do best. Don't come out and start passing it on first down like we did when, against Cal Poly in Northern Arizona. Second and 10, third and 10 is just going to kill us in this game if we get into yeah. that kind of game. There's been plenty of times this year uh, on third down conversions. And interestingly enough, and I, I had this stat up and I don't have it in front of me, but the Bobcats are a top 10, top 20 team in third down conversions. But a lot of that is like we get in a third and 11, we just hand the ball up to Elijah Elliott and he runs for 12 yards. We're against Cal Poly, got in a third and 11, Marquis Johnson went for 20 yards. Like, that's just not going to happen yeah. against the Grizz. You can't get into third and tens and just hand, all right, well, I guess, all right, we'll finally get a first down by handing the ball off. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> so you can't get into no. these holes. <laughs> it doesn't have to be like third and two every time, but it can't be third and behind the sticks, you know, third and 11, third and 12. Uh, can't be that. No. That's what the Grizz defense all thrives right. on. So that's uh, that's the matchup. I think first downs are going to be hugely important. One of the thoughts on this game is not necessarily just the Cat Grizz, but the implications of winning the Big Sky Conference, the first time we could win the Big Sky Conference since 2012, and then securing maybe a top two to top three seed in the playoffs. Is that more important to you than winning the Cat Grizz? Can you phrase that again? Well, I guess it's like it's synonymous. Like if we win the Cat Grizz, we would win the conference championship. First time since 2012. We I mean, would get probably a top two, top three seed in the playoffs. Do you th- Is winning a conference championship, is getting a top seed more important to you than just simply just beating the Grizz? Oh, no. No. <laughs> I mean, the Cat Grizz is just one piece of a season to me. There's so much more on the line than winning Cat Grizz, but... Like we talked about earlier. So you would agree with me then or agree with that statement then? The grit winning, the grits are the least important part of whatever you just said. Okay. So yes, we're in concert with that. Okay. So yes, I think, uh, they're the, and the, but as, like we talked about earlier, the cat Grizz is always the last game of the season. So it kind of spoils whatever plans you have. If you go, if you're gunning for high seed, you have to beat the Grizz to do that. So mm-hmm. it's all, it's all interconnected. And there, now there is a chance this year that we lose Cat Grizz. UC Davis beats Sac State, and we still share the championship. But man, what a bitter way to do that! A bittersweet way to win the to share a conference title by losing, and then the other team also loses, and we're both like one loss teams. Is anyone else a one loss team? No. So, uh, yeah. So basically, yeah. If we lose and Sac State loses, we tie, and that'd be the most bittersweet way to share a conference championship ever. I was hoping we were already have it in hand. I was hoping Sac State would have lost. Yeah. Yeah. In, <laughs> ha- in hindsight, we, we should have wanted uh, Idaho to beat Sac State. But uh, Oh, absolutely. But yeah, everything is on the line still. So everything everything that we want is still in front of us, whether we beat the Grizz or not. And that's kind of the important thing to keep in mind. But look at last year. I wonder if we lose, what's our seed? Five? Yeah, I've been thinking about that. Last year, we got punished harshly. Like We barely got seeded last year. We were we were in the conversation for like a two seed. Then we lose on the road to the Grizz in a, in a bad way, and we dropped to an eight seed. I just, maybe the, maybe the Bobcats have a li- little bit more respect now nationally on the committee. So they realize like, Hey, that was a, uh, I mean, mean, it depends how the loss is, but I don't think the cats drop worse than sixth if we lose this one, but I don't know, man. I don't know how bad we get punished for it. We got punished pretty bad last year. If the Grizzlies win, are they in? Yeah, I would say so. Oh, I mean, sorry. Yes, they would be eight and three. If they lose, are they in? 
Maybe. They have to have help. Yeah. Then Exactly. There is quite a few teams in the FCS that have quite a bit better record, albeit in a worse conference. Yes, they need some help. No, I was I mean, I was hoping thinking that we might do a second episode this week. It would be playoff implications, but there is a scenario in which uh, Idaho, UC Davis, and Montana all finish seven and four, and I think Montana is the odd man out in that scenario. Yeah, UC Davis would have two top, uh, two top wins on that yeah. resume. It'd be UC Davis. Idaho would for have sure. the heads up, and then Idaho would have the head-to-head win. But Idaho would be ranked like eighteenth, and the Grizz would be ranked like I don't know fifteenth. What are they ranked right now? I remember, but. I mean, there'd be 13th. I think tradition and history would be on the Grizz favor in this one. That'd be a hard one. That'd yeah. be a hard one. The Grizz would, uh, I'm just saying that the Grizz need to win this game for sure. They don't want to be in a scenario where, where the playoff community is be choosing between them and Idaho. Do you think the Grizzlies could win the national championship this year? No. I don't think they can beat Me either. the Dakotas. I don't think so. That you had a stat in the, in your document that you crafted about their record, like you like. Uh, oh yeah, so yeah. The I mean, this is obviously before they play the Bobcats, but the combined records of the teams that the Grizz have beaten is seventeen and fifty three. They haven't beaten a single team with a winning record. Their best win is probably Northwestern State from the Southland, who is currently four and six, but somehow tied for first in the Southland Garbage Conference. Uh, and the combined records of the teams that they've lost to a 24 and six. And I do want to caution Bobcat fans who look to that losing streak for the Grizz as some sort of like obvious sign that the cats are going to win this game. I mean, I'll be level headed and rational, rational person. I can, cause that's what I am on this podcast. I mean, Lucas Johnson didn't hardly play at Sac state and he did not play at Weaver state at all. Those games could very well have been different if Lucas Johnson was this, quarterback because that's it's like the Bobcats last year in the playoffs like the 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 draft the drop from Lucas Johnson to Chris Brown is who they ran is even worse than it was from Tommy Mallott to Tucker Rovick so you you can say like oh next man up all you want but it's you know Lucas Johnson makes that offense go Chris Brown is not a good quarterback and I think Chris Brown is honest obviously honestly uh third string now I think Daniel Britt has surpassed him so the point is that three game losing streak, you know, it doesn't ex- mean the Grizz are a bad football team. And we talked about that as they were going through it, still ranking them in our power pools and all that stuff, ranking them. But it's, 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 uh, you know, don't, don't, uh, look too much into that, unfortunately. No, but it does illuminate some flaws maybe in the coaching scheme. Like the fact that the fact, the matter of fact is they did lose those three games. They did play Chris Brown. They did not develop Chris Brown as a quarterback. It is a flaw in their system. It's a flaw in their system and it's a flaw in their, uh, maybe their coaching strategies where they, you know, Chris Brown, obviously it wasn't working. Why didn't they do anything for Weaver State to change that? You saw what he did at Sac State, didn't get it done, whatever. They went into Weaver State hoping that somehow that would be different. And they managed 114 yards of total offense. I mean, that's a that's a coaching failure. Yeah, that is 100. percent Absolutely so, right. I do think overall the Bobcats are much much better at coaching through adversity than the Grizz are, and playing through adversity than the Grizz are. Mm-hmm. The Grizz just the oh, Grizz gosh, coaching yeah. staff, the the players, everyone just thrives on things going the way they want right off the bat, and then just snowballing. And if they don't, that's when the Grizz are in big trouble because they can't adjust. And that's exactly what happened last year when in the second play of the game that Junior Bergen caught the ball and over Troy Anderson and then took it to the house because Jeff Manning took a, bit, a poor angle on it. And then it was just game over from that point. It's just like when they catch the momentum and they ride it, they do it better than anybody I've ever seen. But that is what they want to do. And if they can't do that, they really struggle. They really struggle. And I think Montana State has to stem that. Do you think uh, the premise of the person who scores first in this game will win? Nope. Not at all. Okay. Because that was being talked on a radio show today, and and I don't agree with that. 
either. I think Montana State's more level headed. I think I don't know the, the the statistics, but how many games have we played from behind this year? I mean, I'm pretty sure every single team has scored up the first on us. <laughs> it feels like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's not true. Not every single one, but it's been stinking it close. Good. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Does if Montana if the Grizzlies score first against Mon or MSU and MSU goes like three and out, we do some sort of stupid stuff and and get buried. Is the game over then? Nope. Does it feel it feels like game over? It's gonna feel like a pretty bad feeling in my stomach, I'll tell you that much. But yeah, let's let's look at <laughs> last year's squad. Like, how did the Bobcats win last year? They got out to leads and then just did nothing on offense and let the defense win the game. That was the formula. Yep. Look at Weaver State mm-hmm. last year. What was that what was that game? Thirteen to seven. I don't remember the score in that game. Ew. It was yeah. ugly. It was ugly. The Bobcats got up and then just basically just ran the ball up the gut three times in a row for six yards and then punted. And they over and over and over <laughs> oh and over again. <laughs> yeah. Because we I knew the defense that. we knew the defense could stop Weaver State. This year is so different. Like we can just snatch momentum back. We can we can score 40 unanswered points from a starting point in the middle of the second quarter to the end of the third quarter. Like that's, this yeah. team is built so differently. And I agree with Brent Vegan on that hundred percent. I think if the Grizz do snatch momentum and jump out to a lead, the Bobcats can get it back. Will they? I don't know. I'm saying I have much more faith in that stemming the Grizz onslaught than, than I had last year. Yeah. And it's in Bozeman. Like the crowd's Concern. not going to be on their side as much as it is in Missoula. And that's why their oh. road record's con- much worse. A concern for me is for the Cats is when they when things go wrong, they go wrong on both sides of the ball simultaneously. <laughs> it feels like the second quarter in the last couple of weeks has been like, oh gosh, well, here we go. Second quarter. We're just gonna give it up. And they're like three now, big plays on defense. You're like, can we not like do this in tandem defense? Just get the stops. Offense will figure it out. Yeah. No, it's it's weird. No, I mean you're right on that, and I do I do agree with that. But I don't know. I just I feel like uh, the Bobcats can can make a game of it. A big key for me here is uh is something I think it benefited the Bobcats. The Bobcats have won all their close games. The the Grizz have lost all their close games. So I think if it's yeah. a close game in the fourth quarter, as long as we can keep it in. Bobcat, like Bobcat distance. What does that mean? Keep it in striking distance. The, the beers are starting to get to me a little bit here. Um, <laughs> the Bobcat, the Bobcat distance. distance. We'll call it that. If you're if you're within a touchdown at the end of the game, you're, you're within Bobcat distance. You're going to win that that football game. <laughs> Coined that just now on accident due to alcohol content in my system. But I think the Bobcats. If it's close game in the fourth quarter, I like the Bobcats way more than I like the Grizz in that scenario. All right. Let's talk about, uh, I want to talk about this guy named Nick Otsmo, who is like all of a sudden kind of a good running back, apparently. So his previous, what do you got on him? previous career best, uh, I could research, I didn't spend a whole lot of time on this, but was 79 yards in 2019 against Eastern Washington. That was his previous career best. He missed most of 2020, whatever one spring game that they played or two games, whatever it was, uh, and most of last year with an injury. I don't think he's done all that much this year because the Grizz have struggled to run the ball with anybody. And all of a sudden, Mr. Nick Osmo has 26 carries for 221 yards and two touchdowns against the Cal Poly fall-down Mustangs. They're they're a bad football team. But he also had two catches for 39 yards in that one. And then against Eastern Washington, a slightly better defense, but you know we're talking a negative 10 to a negative 9. 11 carries for 146 yards and three touchdowns with two catches for 63 yards and one touchdown. So all of a sudden, Nick Osmo is the dude over there. Marcus Knight in the transfer portal. He's not on the team anymore. He's he's out completely. So you're you're running with Nick Osmo, which is a uh, I don't know if we should be worried about Nick Osmo or not because I mean his he's had, his two best games of his career against the two worst rushing defenses I think I've ever seen in the Big Sky Conference. Yeah, I mean he's no Lonzo Gilliam. Nope, but he looked fast enough. He looks strong. He's I'll tell you yeah, what if he the, does, if, he, he's a big strong fast guy. Yeah, if, the, sure. if the Cats keep trying to knock people out instead of uh, you know wrapping up, they're, they're going to have a problem with Nick Osmo. That's true. Yeah. 
but 221 yards against Cal Poly. Has he met Marquis Johnson? Yeah, he did that. You know, did he do that uh, in one half with Marquis Johnson? I don't think so. 26 carries. Marquis Johnson did that on only 13 carries. Thank you. So (laughs) another another player to think about is Lucas Johnson. And Coach Vegan talked about him today. He said, you know, when Lucas is in, U of M looks different. And there is no, I mean, that is no doubt. When Lucas Johnson plays, the offense looks completely different. Now, I, I did not watch this Daniel Britt play against uh, Eastern Washington. I, I don't know his I, – I don't, I don't know the take on him. What, what are the guys saying over there about Daniel Britt before we go into Lucas Johnson? Oh, the Grizz fan pod guys love him. That's all I know. Okay. But they, they also loved Chris Brown. They were tuning they Chris did. Brown horn for a long time. They so. Were. Uh, whatever those guys want to say, right? But uh, Lucas Johnson, he went off in crutches. Uh, like we said, some cat fans think it's just smoke and mirrors, whatever. Does Lucas Johnson pr- pose a huge threat to the Montana State Bobcats? Yes. Yeah, I, I agree so. Yeah, I'm not going to sit there and say no. Uh, Lucas Johnson's biggest strength is something that's kind of hurt the Bobcats. When the bo- pocket collapses, a guy steps into the, the pocket and then fires downfield. Cal Poly, uh, Brash, whatever his name is, did that several times. It's like mm-hmm. Lucas Johnson's a guy you want to not necessarily pressure or not necessarily sack. You want to keep him in the pocket. I think he's a worse pocket passer than he is a guy who can make plays while scrambling. So you almost want to keep him in the pocket. I'd be okay with zero sacks in this game if Lucas Johnson doesn't actually ever break the pocket. Do you think he plays? Yes, I do. <laughs> I kind of hope he does because if he plays, he's probably not going to be a hundred percent. I mean, he we can be able to get after him. He will. I mean, it could be a situation. I remember uh, 2019 was it where, um, oh Dalton Sneed wasn't fully healthy, and I, you could tell in that game he wasn't who he was earlier in the season. But I think a hobbled Lucas Johnson is still probably their best bet. So I think he plays unless he like literally can't play. And I don't know if I buy the whole the crutches thing. Which is just kind of funny. I mean, just it just seems like a Bobby Houck thing to do. Is, is uh, and he he didn't look like he was that hurt, and he was smiling on the sideline, all jovial, and all of a sudden, the next thing he's coming out on crutches. I don't know. I don't know if it's gamemanship yeah. or whatever. Or maybe they're just giving him crutches to you know help protect his whatever ails him. But I think he will play. And if he doesn't, man, Daniel Britt first career start, Cat Grizz on the road. That's not how you want to do it. <laughs> no. Mark Dessen. <laughs> Mark Dessen and uh, I guess not Jake, Jake Bles- Bleskin. No, that wasn't his career start because he, he played against Stephen F. Austin and threw for like 400 some yards. But Mark Dessen's, I believe, first career start was Cackers. And yeah. I believe we lost that game 3-35. to Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Other guys to be aware of for the Grizz. Uh Offensively, like that's mainly their dudes. Like I couldn't really hardly name any of their wide receivers because they don't seem to do too much. I mean, I guess there is Cole Grossman, who is a big threat at, from the tight end position, very athletic, more of a receiving threat than he is kind of a blocking blocker kind of guy. And I couldn't even name a receiver besides Malik Flowers, who doesn't do a whole lot. Who's a receiver? Who am I missing? Oh, Mitch Roberts, I guess, would be I guess maybe the biggest target. I feel like those guys are all seniors too. Like the, the Grizzlies have like very senior laden stars. Am I mean, I, wrong? I think this is like, if you're looking at it as a Grizz fan, like this is kind of the year you're expecting. Like if you're going to make a run, this is the year, right? Cause they lose a lot of guys next year. I would assume so. Cause I think Patrick yeah. O'Connell is a senior. Uh, Robbie Houck is a senior. Justin Ford's a senior. Malik Flowers may or may not be a senior. Um, Hold on one second. Is O'Connell playing? He's he's been hurt the last two weeks. So yeah, what is the the status update on Patrick O'Connell? He hasn't played in like two weeks. Is he, have you heard if he's going to play this one or not? It's yeah, I haven't heard. That's a big, big question. I think it's a big I mean, deal. He's a dude. Does, yeah, he is a dude. What's he's, his injury? I I don't know. Like I don't pay I don't pay as much as. A, attention to the Grizz as I have in uh, previous lives. I don't have, I, don't, I have barely enough time to focus on the cats, <laughs> let alone learn these kinds of things that I would on other teams. I don't know what his injury status is or what his injury is. Yeah. 
Well, he, I mean, he was a Buck Buchanan like finalist last year. So if he comes back, he's, He's a dude. Like he's he's fast. He's strong. He does it all. So, I mean, he, like he's a guy you want to root for. Like he is one of the Grizzlies. I'd be like, man, that, yeah. Like that guy deserves props. I think like, he was a walk on as a cat Pets, fan, right? <laughs> he is. He is the man. So, yeah, he's like the Troy Anderson of. Well, not really. That's a bad. He's like Dante Olson, really. I take. I t- yeah. I take that back. He's a faster Dante Olson. There yeah. it is. He's a faster Dante Olson, and. Hopefully we have the similar result, results as last time we played against Dante Olson. We made him look yeah. pretty pedestrian. Um, 2019. Justin Ford, a guy, um, we're struggling, struggling in the passing game. I don't know if we, how many times I'd want to test Justin Ford, their cornerback, a guy who is, uh, like led the FCS in interceptions last year. I'm not sure how he's doing this year. I think he's doing pretty good again, but, uh, you know, something, something to keep an eye on. As our as our passing game isn't exactly hitting its stride right now, um, Justin Ford might be able to factor into this too. Yeah, I'm not so certain I'm sold on these 50-50 balls anymore because we don't have guys that have 50-50 talent. Robbie Alston has been kind of shaky lately. Um, Willie Patterson simply just doesn't have the height to make the 50-50 balls yeah. all that productive. I mean, he's an awesome receiver. I think he has the skill to get those balls, but sometimes you're just not tall enough, man. It's just... (laughs) Exactly. And that's not a knock on Willie. It just is what it is. So, uh, yeah. Is he being put in position to succeed or not? Question. Yeah, right? He's having a good year. If we could run him over the middle. Yeah. Do some pick plays, put him in, in space where he gets the ball. We have such good blocking receivers. And that's what I don't understand about Montana State passing game is like why aren't we trying to get the ball in space and let our receivers do what they do well <laughs> you know it's frustrating it's watching other teams sit in the pocket and then find a guy wide open on our defense i feel like we never have a wide open receiver ever yeah. i don't know if that's our receivers not getting separation i don't know if it's that our quarterbacks don't stay in the pocket long enough to let those routes develop or i just don't know if those are just straight aren't in the playbook but it just seems like every ball we throw is a contested ball uh, that's down the sidelines. I, I mean, obviously, we we do some little, like, hook patterns. We hit a guy for eight yards, like Derek Snell for eight yards, and he falls forward for two more yards or something like that. But there's just been no guy streaking wide open, it feels like. And the few times that has, has mm. happened, we haven't been able to uh, hit him. Yeah, it's, it, is, it is odd, and it's very frustrating. You would think there'd be more of that considering but- how – Teams have to defend the Bobcats because they have to stack so many, so much in the box to try and stop the Bobcats. You think there'd be some guys wide open, but I guess if it's all man coverage, there's going to be a guy following every receiver. I think a lot of that uh, open stuff is more of a zone when you when there's miscommunications and stuff. I'm tired of watching the Good Bobcats on defense. Uh, I'm just going to keep going randomly here. It seems like every time there's a big play against the Bobcats, guys look at each other and throw their hands up in the air. Like, who was supposed to cover that? Have you noticed that? I think that's a com- communication thing. I think there's been a communication, like a lag from the p- play calls getting put in from Willie to getting in them in on time and then guys believing in, in that call. Yeah. It seemed a little bit better last uh, last week. There were some really weird non-calls last week. Simeon Woodard, like, literally just got pushed to the ground. <laughs> like complete offensive pass interference and they caught it on him. And the next play, there was a blown coverage and they scored. So that's one of their uh, two uh, inner or two touchdowns in that first quarter. Excuse me, not in the first quarter, first half, but it's just weird. Like you're right. There's been a lot of like, what are we doing? Who's got that guy? Yeah. And I, I was thinking about this just like randomly off and on for quite a while now. It's like, is our scheme too complicated? Are we asking the guys to do too much? Too varied. I'm not sure because it doesn't seem like they're playing fast. It doesn't seem like they know their assignments. Whether it's communication from the coaches, whether it's knowing the scheme, something's awry and it's just not fitting well with the cats right now. It's not. But do you think that has a chance to be improved or functional enough on Saturday? Yes. To wheel this back into I'm, the cat conversation. On this, I still think the cats <laughs> can make strides in their passing game and the pass defense game is what I've been trying to say. Yeah, I, I I believe it. But you know, you never get anything from the players when they talk on, like on these pressers when they go on YouTube. It's clear that Montana State has coached up the players on what to say. 
they're all doing the company lines. You'd never learn anything. It's all about execution, keeping your eyes in the same place, leverage, blah, blah, blah. Who cares anymore? Like, I don't even care about these player interviews because they, they don't give me anything. We have well-spoken guys. They represent our university well. Great, fine. But there's nothing, you never mine a good nugget from, from that unless they slip up. Like Marquis Johnson, for instance, right? We talked about that yesterday. He said he was nervous for the Cat Grizz. I guarantee you he probably wasn't supposed to say that. And no. looking back on that, you know. I mean, it, it, I still enjoyed it, but, you know, it's not something you really want yeah. to put out in the media for sure. But when they asked uh, Callahan O'Reilly, when they asked Ty Akata, what are you guys working on? You know, uh, I think Victor Flores does a nice job of asking these probing questions about like, hey, what are you guys going to work on? How do you shore that up? And they're like, yeah, we just need to execute better. We need to have our eyes in a better place. We need to know our keys. Is it just that simple? I don't think it is. I think those are just company lines that they're telling them to say. I don't know. I would love for someone to say, say, our scheme is off. We need to do better. You know, no one's going to say that, though. But that's what I want to know. You want to sit down with Coach Vegan, give him a couple beers and listen to him. A little truth serum. I want to hear what he says. Yeah, truth serum. There you go. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's good the way the Bobcats players answer questions in the media because I think the Bobcat defense has obviously struggled throughout times, but I feel like they've never like given up or gotten discouraged by their play. They just know that, all right, well, let's just get out there and make a play next time. I feel like mentality is good. The execution is not, but I like the, I like the mentality and the focus that they have to not get down after getting beat for a big 60 yard touchdown pass where it was wide open. Nobody was there. Like they don't just like uh, get frustrated that there's no like, I don't know. They're, they're still keeping it going the best they can. And I, I do appreciate that. So those questions are important to answer because you don't want anyone visibly or, uh, you know, putting anything negative out in the public sphere. Yeah. Well, time to write the ship, right? And what a game to do it in the cat grids. If you want to send your team rocketing into the playoffs, a team that can score 400 yards on the ground on any day, and then be backed up by a stalwart defense. This is the game to do it. Let's start to do that. You know, put the money where the mouth is. I'd love to see that. All right. Let's start uh, maybe trying to wrap some things up a little bit. I guess um, I do have a couple more questions and we do have some golden coolie questions. So, you know, it's, it's a little early for us though. So uh, it's, it's longer episode, but we started earlier than we, than we normally do. So that's good. Right. I don't know how you feel about that. How do you think the Bobcats attack the Grizzly defense? And how do you think the Grizzly defense attacks the Bobcat offense? Like, What matchups do you, do you see playing out there? 2019, we were able to run all over these guys. What were we doing that allowed us to run all over these guys? Because they were running the same defense. That's something I don't get. I understand that we weren't going to run the ball last year in Washington Grizzly Stadium, force-feeding Isaiah Fonse. I think Montana State can attack these guys with the run game, the outside zone, the inside zone, the different running backs, the different speeds. And here's why I think that, Thorny, did you watch the Weber State game against Montana? Weber State was able to run the ball against Montana. Yeah, but a little bit. Not to the tune of like 200 yards, though. I think we have though, a better running game than Weber, though. Oh, though. we have the best it's, running game in the country. Exactly. So that's what I'm saying is I think we will be able to run on these guys. I don't think Montana's defense, I think they might stop us early, but eventually when we lean on them enough, 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 if we get them out of their scheme, they're not going to be out of their scheme. If we can hit them where they're not rushing, essentially, where they are not blitzing, then we will have some gash plays on them. So that I think that's our biggest weapon. Yeah, this 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 running attack is different than those other years where you were kind of like, running power a lot and eventually teams just mm -hmm. wore down and then you started having gash plays like this team is gash plays from like the first series. I think it's a lot more mm -hmm. creative. I think it gives uh, the offensive line is uh, doing a really good job blocking and the way that they're blocking their zone blocking is not so dependent on like you don't have this guy you're blocking this area. And I think that's where something could be beneficial against a team like the Grizzlies. Uh, where they're doing all sorts of stunts and trying to cause confusion. You don't care about that because you're just blocking your little, you know, five foot radius. If there's not a guy there, then you run over and you crack back down and, you know, find a blocker and take that guy. I mean, let's, let's talk a little bit how historically good this Bobcat rushing attack is. This is a good time to talk about this. Cause I did some research on this and it's like, well, this is, we haven't talked about it yet. This is the time to talk about it. <laughs> 
the Bobcat rushing offense is currently number two uh, all time in Montana State history, averaging what 314 yards per game right now. The the mm-hmm. the uh, the record is 323 in 1956. That's like the the Paul Schaefer, I think, was the guy, right? That we talked about having like the MSU <laughs> record. I think that was the 50s, so it's probably the Paul Schaefer era. So they, if they kept that up, they'd finish number two all time. Um, I mean, obviously, there's the whole playoff schemes to go, so things can change a lot there. But currently, they're the number one all time in yards per rush by a lot. They're currently sitting at 6.6 yards per carry this year. The the best mark in program history is 5.69 in 2017. Gosh, man. It's crazy. I mean, crazy to think. Coming into this <laughs> coming into this year, we were talking about the offensive line and how we were going to have to pick up the pieces. We got better. We legit got better. Yeah. The the most rushing touchdowns ever scored in program history was 44 in 2019. And it's it's hard to know the pace. But I, I kind of calculated it. that's basically 2.9 rushing touchdowns per game. We're, we're scoring 3.6 rushing touchdowns per game currently. We don't have 44 touchdowns yet, but if you keep the pace up, it will be the most prolific scoring rushing attack of all time. This is historically a historical rushing offense we're witnessing right now. And that's why when, I, when Vegan says we don't really need to do a whole lot differently, I agree with that. I don't think it kind of matters what defense... Like teams know what we're gonna do. They stack the box. They do everything they can. They know what they're doing. The Bobcats are doing every week, and we do it anyway. So I think the Bobcats kind of do what they do. They might have to kind of do things differently. Maybe test the outside more than they would in other games, or try and like get lateral more. Do a few different creative things here and there. But overall, I think we just kind of do what we've been doing. Yeah, the fly sweeps the. Like you said, pushing the, pushing it to the edge. I think Marquis on the fly sweep, Taco Dowler on the fly sweep, but then just running outside zone. I think the inside zone would is not going to be as effective as the outside zone if we could get these guys in space because they're going to bring all the pressure. Like you said, they're on the stunts, on the blitzes. They're going to roll six guys. They have a three-man front, but they're going to bring six guys up front. But if we can get them on the edge, our running backs have such good vision to hit the holes or hit the cutbacks. Have you noticed that, Thorny? Yes. Like we, most of our big runs are on, on the cutback, not on the hole. And I think that's so, like, Elijah Elliott does that so well. He's such a patient runner, but when he hits that hole, he hits it so hard. I think Elijah Elliott does that better than any any running back on the team right now. No, he, no we, we haven't seen Sumner in a while. Sumner does it really good, but he's been kind of dinged up. Hopefully he's back. We we didn't mention him in the um in the presser, but he was also mentioned in the presser. He should be okay. Yeah, so that's you know you, that's a really good thing to talk about because as these running backs are kind of being patient and following their blockers, what they do so well is put the foot in the ground and cut back up field, and yeah. that's where so many of the big chunk plays have come from. And you are right, Elijah Elliott does that probably probably better than anyone else on the roster right now, and that's such a big thing. Like it, you know, if if you're running to the outside zone and the, and the the Grizz are trailing that. You know, you cut back, and that's where the the holes are. You know, you, you, what you're gonna end up being against the Grizz, you're gonna have to make guys miss because they're gonna be in position. The exactly. Grizz are gonna be in position, and they're sure tacklers. So if you make if you can make a, one or two guys miss, that's where you're gonna find your success. You're gonna have to be shifty, and you're gonna have to avoid some arm arm tackles and uh, be able to break some tackles. And that's really where the success is gonna come from. <laughs> yeah, easier said than I done. I want to see right? Derek Snell. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I don't. I don't want to see Derek Snell put Robbie Halk on his back. Uh, anybody, get out anybody in front. Putting put him on his back. Halk on his back. <laughs> yeah, <come. laughs> uh, I love me some Derek Snell. That guy is so fun to watch. He's becoming one of my favorite Bobcats. <laughs> and the tight end room is really good. Trayton Pickering is also criminally underrated in his blocking as well. Absolutely. When we man. get both those guys going to one side. Like, just just look out. The one thing I want to see, I want to see the Bobcats be able to just run the ball. I really do. Be, nothing would make me more happy than in the first quarter we'd be able to pick up a, like a seven-minute seven, seven minute drive where Montana State's just pounding the rock on these guys and just pounding it into, into the end zone. Like, if we can do that, like take them all the way down to the end zone, just run the ball, game over, man. Like, that's the cats right there. That's the cats. But then if we start coming out... <laughs> 
<laughs> Taylor House right. This is the thing that just bugs the, the living snot out of me. We will do this, and then Taylor House right will be like, all right, let's start passing it on first down, guys. Let's see what we got. I have a feeling that it's not going to be that way in Kakers. I think he was just knowing we were playing two overmatched opponents the last couple of weeks, and they were just trying some things out. That's what I'm uh, I'm hoping okay. to myself. That's what I'm telling myself. Just a little shy now of it, man. I mean, yeah. the last two weeks. Yeah. You know, the little self-scout. Taylor House right. You know, he's one of the coaches that has done so much better this year. I think his evolution as a coach from year one to year two has been really noticeable. Now, we do some really creative things in the running game, more so than we did last year. But I just think we have a – I think a lot of this, honestly, uh, stems from quarterbacks, especially Tommy Mallott, who make good decisions with the RPO game, with the with the zone read, whatever you want to call it, the option game. They're making good choices when to give the ball, when to keep the ball, and it's not so predetermined and it's not so obvious to defenses who's getting the ball. Matt McKay was very much like he's going to hand the ball off, like most of the time. You never know what Tommy Watt's mm-hmm. going to do. And Sean Chambers, you know, he probably keeps it more than Tommy, but he still makes pretty good decisions there too. So I think that's what makes this team more dangerous and different than last year's team. It's just, it's led by two guys, one guy in particular who can just make better decisions in this game. And that makes it much harder to defend. I think you see both Tommy Mallott and Sean Chambers back in the in the backfield at the same time. Yeah. Why not? Put Sean Austin back there at the same time, too. All right. Just <laughs> when I said don't get cute, here I am talking about putting three quarterbacks in the games one time. <laughs> All right. Let's flip the script then. What can the Grizz or what can the, the the Bobcat defense do to slow down? Let's assume Lucas Johnson is going. What can they do to slow down Lucas Johnson and Nick Osmo in that attack from the Grizz offense? I think we need to get enough enough depth in our in our drops so we can uh not get burned uh i think that's one thing we did with uh cal poly that i i really liked we're gonna have to cover the edges pretty good with uh, nick osmo i don't i'm not too worried about osmo running against our d D line up through the gaps but where they're going to make hay with him is like on a swing pass on the outside and get him on the boundary can we can rylan Ort come up and make the tackle that's going to be kind of a big, a big, a big key to this game for me. But yeah, in just depth, in depth on our our zone defense, depth on the zone defense, absolutely. I think the you know Callahan or O'Reilly did a lot better job of that at Cal Poly. That's why he got himself an interception, absolutely. a couple of pass breakups. He finally, we finally saw some linebacker depth. I don't know what it was, what changed, but it feels like that was finally maybe something that could be a potential turning point for the for the defense. Uh, well, those are good points. Not, Osmo is not a guy who's going to necessarily kill you if you don't seal the edge. He'll make you. I mean, he'll still get ten yards. He's not going to go for, you know, seventy yards on a on a outside read play against the Bobcat defense. I don't think he's that fast, but you know, he looked plenty fast against Eastern Washington and everything. But you're you're right. I think uh, being able to tackle him in space, be able to come up and hit him when he gets the swing pass, or whatever, it's going to be huge. And the like I said earlier, I think just keeping Lucas Johnson trying to keep him contained in the pocket so he's not making plays on the run. He's not stepping into the pocket and firing downfield. I think that's going to be kind of a key, kind of keeping him back there, bouncing around in the pocket, not letting him break contained. Random question, Thornton. Who was the Grizz quarterback last year? <laughs> uh, so who was that? Cam Humphreys? Okay, yeah, I think you're right. They, they went through some injuries last year, too. So I think Chris Brown ended up playing against James Madison because Cam Humphreys got hurt against James Madison. So I think Cam Humphreys was the quarterback during Cat Grizz, question mark. Hmm. All right. Doesn't matter. Like, that that tells you what their, their offense – like, their offense got shut down last year. They just kept getting the ball on our side of the field, like, at the 40, and then go five yards and kick a field goal. They kicked, what, five field goals last year in Cat Grizz? <laughs> That's right. So, I mean, the, the score was 29 to 10, and everybody said it was an absolute butt whipping. Was it? Yeah, it kind of was because it was. We couldn't move the stinking, the stinking ball, but 29 10 doesn't feel like a, a butt whipping. Well, let's remember we scored on like the last drive of the game when they had their backups in. It should have been 29 to 3 in reality, which is yeah. not, not, you know, their defense, their defense killed us no matter how you slice it. That's, that's right. <laughs> All right. 
is the moment going to be too big for the Bobcats in this game? Is is game day coming to Bozeman going to be a distraction? That, you know, that's a good question. That's a really good question. I think every player, so I watched RJ Fitzgerald, Takata, Callahan O'Reilly, and the media asked them that same question. And they're like, no, we got, we have to minimize that. We have to downplay that right now. We have to focus in uh, on the game. I don't think it's going to be too big. I think honestly though, Ryan, I think the Grizzlies are better suited for the big moment just because they, that's what they need. They need the, the pomp and circumstance because when they, when they capitalize on that, that's their sauce. Does Montana state need that? No, I don't think so, but I do think it benefits the Grizzlies a little bit more. No, that's that's a good point. The Bobcats are much more even keeled and kind of can kind of take their show on the road a little bit more than the than the Grizz can. But this isn't exactly a typical road game for the Grizz because there's going to be, you know, there's going to be thousands of Grizz fans in the stadium cheering them on. So it's going to be an electric environment for them to feed off the energy where the Bobcats aren't so energy energy driven. They're more business work like than the Grizz. And, but that's also served the this served the the cats very well under Brent Vegan. So that's the question I have for you is, do you think this game is more one on aggression and energy or scheme and execution? That's a great question. I mean, historically, you wanted to say like whoever comes out and is the aggressor usually wins Cat Grizz. This feels a little bit different this year, but I do think the Bobcats have to match the physicality at the very least. So if you're pick, if you're asking me to pick between the two, then yeah, I'd probably say whoever can kind of kind of come out and punch, do the most punches wins. Let's get to some uh, golden coolie questions. Let's wrap this up. Do you have one queued up? Because I don't have anything ready yet. <laughs> I don't. I thought you did. I mean, Open I'm, up gl- I'm glad you just like randomly pivoted to a golden coolie question without any sort of uh, build up to it, and then like, <laughs> why don't you have something ready for this question that I just. Just uh, that's typically what I do. It's, it's really good. Teton good Cat asks us, is our consistent run game due to a better overall offensive line this year or the change to more of an outside, run, outside zone run scheme? Yes. Yeah, I would, have, I would have to say the outside <laughs> zone. Smaller guys, right? And so, like, we tried to think about this, Ryan, and this is, I think this is a, a, apropos for this conversation is, the reason why I don't think we are good at the power game, I mean, not to say we're not good at the power game, but to be good at the power game, you need polling guards that are just wreckers. We don't have huge guards this year, but we have fast guards. And so we get those guys in space, and that's where we're really making our hay. I think it's both. I think, you know, consistent run game due to a better offensive line, or is it change in zone and scheme? I just think the scheme fits the the offensive line better. Last year, we were, we were kind of yeah. a mismatch of guys who could do one thing. Some guys that could do, what, like what you're saying, the power zone better, but we also had smaller guys like Justice Perkins. I think this year, we just kind of found a scheme that fits the entire line's personnel really well, and we haven't really missed a beat when guys have gone out and other guys have stepped up. So I think, I think this, I guess probably the scheme more than anything. Individual talent's probably not as good. I don't think any of those guys are going to end up in the NFL, but... This, you know, they're playing better than I would have ever predicted. Might be the best playing offensive line that we've had in a long in, in years. And that's saying something in Montana State. Yeah, you're not wrong. All right, T-Dub says, what is the proverbial straw that broke ESPN's back to opt for game day in Bozeman? This is a good question. The effort's been going on a, on the Big Sky for a couple of years. What ultimately tipped the scales? Why did it come to Bozeman and not Missoula last year? You know, I mean that that's pretty much the big question T Dub's asking right there. I mean, it's just a circumstance. It's just what other FBS games going on during that time frame. There just wasn't a huge marquee matchup. UC, USC and UCLA was the big one that I thought we were gonna lose out to. But I think I think honestly, probably uh UCLA losing to Arizona, kind of knocking them down the rankings may have been the final straw that did that. But, I mean, 
that's all, that's all I can really think of. It's just kind of the circumstances. Is there a better matchup? Is there a better story somewhere else? Because game day is kind of story driven. I'm sure that the uh, big sky, you know, the brawl of the wild has been on their radar for a, radar for a while, despite what Grizz fans will tell you that they manifested the entire thing last year. I think it has been on the radar for a while, and this is maybe kind of tip the scales. Is there was just no better FBS storyline on Saturday than than there was brawl of the wild. I think that's a great answer. I think I agree 100% with that, actually. Another thing might be, like, coming to Bozeman, There's it's easy access. There's a lot of flights to Bozeman. It might just, like, everything might just have lined up perfectly for this to happen. I mean, Yellowstone, the TV series, could be Ugh. could be putting this on the map, too. Just people being obsessed with Montana right now. Maybe that helped out, man. There's, there's lots of reasons here. I know, it makes yeah. everyone sigh or groan, Ugh, Yellowstone, but... You know, maybe that's part of it too. I don't know. Maybe Kevin Costner's the guest speaker. We do have a Golden Cooley question on that. Fully, where was it? Uh, well, I'll find who asked it. He's but, a guest picker. Yeah, I'll, I'll find who asked it so I can give them credit. But who would you pick as uh, the guest picker, guest uh, for, for game day? Who would Ryan Foley like to see? Oh my gosh, I'm, I've been thinking about this since you texted me this, and the only person I can think of is somebody who's dead. Charlie Russell. Charlie freaking Russell is who I would pick. That's a terrible answer. An absolute terrible <laughs> answer. <laughs> I didn't know. I was like, that's the first guy that came to my mind. I was like, cool. He's the most Montanan guy I could think of is Charlie Russell. I'm going to pick, I'm going to pick Charlie Russell. <laughs> Jeez. That's a terrible, man. It's a great falls guy. Well, if I we can expand the question to, to people the dead or alive, then a whole, whole, whole different story. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've been thinking about this too. Like, I want it to be someone who's kind of connected to Montana in some way, not just some like you know, not Kevin Costner necessarily. Um, I think Flint Rasmussen would be pretty cool, especially if he was like decked out in full like clown gear, like rodeo clown gear. I think that'd be pretty funny. <laughs> Having like a rodeo clown he... sitting up there. <laughs> yeah, but is he famous enough? No, nah, probably not. I-, I love the pick. And probably I love not. The pick, yes. But I mean But I don't think he's famous enough. Well then I mean who else? Who's he got? the most famous Montanans, you know? I mean guys who are connected to, to the program or just Montanans in general. I mean you got uh Dennis Erickson would be an option. Um <laughs> I mean the most famous entertainer. Montana State alumni is Craig Kilborn, but he's, you know, he's not, this isn't 20 years ago. You know, he's not really in the spotlight anymore. Doesn't have a show anymore. I don't know, man. I don't know. There's not a lot of like easy, obvious options. Yeah. It makes Charlie Russell feel very comfortable, right? He's, I mean, I'm, that's I, a good I love option, Charlie Russell, man. Russell, but he is deceased. So, you know, I'm going to make you pick him. someone alive. I'm changing it. You got to pick someone who's living. <laughs> Was it Michael Keaton living? Didn't he have a like, yeah. Batman? You know, yeah, he's, good old he's got Michael a place Keaton. somewhere in Montana. I mean, everyone rich has a place somewhere in Montana. So, I mean, that's kind of, it is what it is on that regard. Uh, Nick Faldo? I mean, the, the guy just followed us, right? He did. <laughs> Never in my uh, Bobcat <laughs> podcasting journey did I think a retired Masters win, winner, winning golfer would be following our following us on Twitter, but here we are, Nick, Nick Faldo. Um, I mean, that could be fun, I guess, but he's, you know, he's, <laughs> he's a big name, but he has no real connection other than he has like a farm type thing out. in I don't even know where Montana somewhere. I mean, that's what it is. You, yeah. I don't do, know. Do you man. want it represented a by a question. guy who has like spent some of his millions of dollars buying a place in, in Montana, or do you want it someone who's like kind of homegrown type situation? That's where I think Flint Rasmussen is more fun. It doesn't matter if you know who he is. If he, I just have like the most famous rodeo clown there is. <laughs> be kind of cool. <laughs> I just imagine a guy yeah, decked out really rodeo good. clown costume, like how much fun the, the set would have with that. I don't know if he would dress like that or not. If Flint if Flint's on there or not, <laughs> but that's, that's what I envisioned. I mean, the most entertaining I think it'd be awesome. Flint would be a great choice, to be honest. Think of like John Tester, maybe. Yeah. 
Yeah. But, I mean, you, I don't you, imagine you don't usually have, in politics. Yeah, you don't usually have politicians so. on this thing because that's just no fun for anybody. People have enough politics. Yeah. Sports and politics. Let's, let's keep them apart. Is the Vim Boys uh, asked us. Why not Wadded Cruzado? Vim Boys is who asked us this question. The Vim Boys. Uh, uh, these three guys that are on Twitter that have like a, they dress like they have VIM. They face, you know, chest paint themselves. It's pretty, it's pretty sweet. You're not on Twitter anymore. You don't see these things. Why did Cruzado? I mean, sure, I'm sure she'll make an appearance, but you can't have her as the guest picker. Dennis Erickson would be good. It'd be a good one. I mean, he fits the bill. It'd be good one. People, people, uh, people like famous country singers <laughs> that uh, come from Montana. Nothing I know of. That's the reason why I love Montana. We we just like <laughs> I mean, Troy Anderson. I'm sure there's people. Troy Anderson is one of our biggest of people that we're not thinking of. I'm sure there's plenty of famous people who are just not even coming to our brains. But we're spending too much time on this question, man. We got to get moving here. Good question. All right, I'll be entertained by it no matter who they pick. I'm just I'm excited. I'm excited to see who they pick. Maybe maybe they bring back a guy who's uh, done like the Triangle Classic, like Dan Fouch or somebody. <laughs> Brendan Henshaw. Ask us, how do we think college game day affects the game? I think we kind of already covered that. Vim Boys also asked us, with the addition of a rivalry trophy for the Weber and in NAU games, what other games would you like to see MSU play a trophy for? That's a good Ooh, question. That's a good question. It is, it is an entertaining question. First of all, like who who's our next closest like rival? Is it Weber? There is a rival I want. I want to be rivals with UC Davis. <laughs> Why? I just like UC Davis. I think we're both smart schools, both good college programs. I think there could be like a budding relationship with those guys. I don't want to be rivals with Idaho. Idaho has U of M. Eastern, we're always tied with those guys, but Eastern sucks, man. I like the whole institution just drags me down. Living around those guys just is like, uh, don't even get me started. UC Davis seems like a good option. NAU, screw those guys. Like, I just got a bad taste in my mouth for NAU. But UC Davis, I don't know what the cup would be. They're the Aggies. We're the, we're the Bobcats. There's no connection right there. <laughs> I feel like it took you a second to remember who we were. We're the, <laughs> who oh, are you we? know, the, uh, yeah, the, the Wildcats. I was trying to think of like some like gold miners. They're like, we're not the gold miners. We're, we're the Bobcats. Uh, yeah, there it is. All right. Um, but I don't know. What do you think, Thorny? Who is our protected rival? Is it Northern Colorado? It is. It is Northern Colorado. Well, I don't want to right. choose for that. So I think no, exactly. the answer for me is Weber State. They're they're a similar mountainous oh. region. They're another yeah. we're both wildcats, technically under the umbrella of a wildcat. And uh, I'd like to play them every year because <laughs> I mean they're they're like a I think I believe they are a um a founding member of the Big Sky Conference. They've been in the conference for a long time, whatever you want to call it. That'd be the might be my pick. It would be Weber State. I don't know what the trophy would yeah, be. Yeah, that's probably a smart pick. I like Davis though. Some sort of cat trophy because we're both wild cats of some kind. So some sort of scraggly wow, cat. Wow. <laughs> Just a hissing cat. <laughs> <laughs> One that has like an arched back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just the, the typical With a buff like tail. Yeah, the typical like Halloween cat that's like. <laughs> Like they're just sticking straight up in the back. <laughs> it's a pretty stupid trophy, but why not? <laughs> the, the king cat trophy. Maybe it's like a cat with like a crown, like the best of the, the wild cats, like some sort of crown cat. <laughs> like, a, like a pissed off house cat. <laughs> there we go. Get it done. Montana State Administration, Weber State Administration. Let's create a trophy game. Get them as our protected rival. It's a much harder game, but much better than Northern Colorado. <laughs> oh, I do want to give a shout out to, to uh, Kodiak on Twitter. He's a Grizz fan who asked us who the guest picker would be. Uh, he asked us the same question. We just answered that. But thank you for contributing. Nick Sorry, Deal asked us a, kind of a fun question. Do we have any pregame traditions? Oh, uh, yeah. Put on my same Bobcat shirt that I've been wearing all season. What? <laughs> yeah. For sure, man. I haven't changed that thing up. Of course, I've been wearing the same Bobcat Have shirt. you We've washed been it? On a roll. Of course, I've been washed it. That's true. Well, that's not really um, superstitious. Also, that's just regular stitches. So, pregame traditions uh, fly the flag, fly your flag. Of course, fly your flag. You Get it out there. 
take take a picture for me. Um, we'll put it on our Instagram. Other pregame pr- traditions: text Thorny, see where he's at, yeah. see why he's not going to watch the game because he's super busy this year and doesn't watch any of our football games for some reason. And um, yeah, kind of yeah, yeah, man. Just like get nervous, get my walking shoes on so I can go take some walks around the block when I get a little anxious. <laughs> So many of the games I have to go back and watch again. So I know the outcome, but then I have to go back on ESPN and then watch it so I can be informed so we can talk about this yeah. stuff. <laughs> yeah, you miss big pockets here That's and there. A- uh, I don't really have one, man. I'm just kind of – each week is different kind of depending on what's going on with the, the kids, all these things. My only tradition really is I wear the Gold Rush shirt until we lose. So I, And I don't wash it. So, I, uh, oh, and I, oh, man. so last year, like all the way from like, I didn't you know Wyoming wasn't gold rush yet. <laughs> so I wore it all the way to Cat Grizz last year, like the, the friggin' the gold rush short that washing it. <laughs> I don't really wear it outside. I think I remember that. I, I, I wear it like during the game. Like, and then how I'm do you like, get done. underneath your bed? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Well, there was a whole debate about what shirt I should wear to the national championship game because I wore like a green shirt when we beat South Dakota State. I forgot to put on a bobcat shirt. There's, there's the whole thing. <laughs> but that's really my only annual tradition is I make sure I buy myself a gold rush shirt and I pretty much wear it um, until we lose. And then and I don't wash it. And then I wash it and it's just in the regular rotation. <laughs> so you haven't been wear, wearing it since Oregon State was after gold rush. Yep. Well, I haven't worn it since Oregon State. I called that was good. It was a few games in. I called that called that bad luck at that point. But I, th- I think did I wear it to, okay. to Oregon State? I don't even remember what I wore. I think I think I did. Do you just get rid of it? Do you like get, like no. donate it to like the Goodwill? No, I have like I have a collection, man. I, I've, I'm only missing like one or two years since Gold Rush started, and I'm, I've actually been meaning oh, to wow. like hit Bobcat Nation up and see if I could buy some of the missing years. I've been meaning to like set them out and see what years I'm missing, but I have. I'm positive almost all of them. Little known fact about Ryan. Yeah, one, one of the few like collector things I do. I don't have like a whole lot of Bobcat gear really, but I do make sure I get a Gold Cat Gold Rush shirt every year. Danny Kernan <laughs> on Twitter asked us, expanding on this question, did you have any traditions you did as students? I didn't tailgate. I just went in and like I would stay there. I was always just the guy that just was there for the football. Yeah. I'm kind of the same way. Actually, a lot of times I couldn't find someone to go to the game with because no one wanted to go to the game because it wasn't like the thing to do <laughs> in like 2004, right? Not not what oh, it is now. man. But I, yeah. I came to a point where I actually, I did tailgate, but I stopped drinking at tailgates. I was so amped up. I was so like, that's so much adrenaline. I, I realized that like I just had a beer and it did absolutely nothing. So what's the point of having alcohol in my system, getting calories, if it's not even like... I don't know. I was too nervous to drink, basically. So I didn't really drink at tailgating when I was an, a student. So that's my only my only tradition was that I didn't really drink <laughs> tailgates. <laughs> and I often went to games alone because yeah. no one wanted to go games with me. But I wanted to go, so I went and it sat out. I mean, you could show up 10 minutes before kickoff and get a seat on like the, the fourth row on the 50-yard line on the student section, which was the sunny yep. side, as we called it back then. It was a lot easier to get a ticket, a lot, a lot easier to go to the game. Yep. You didn't even have to get a ticket. All you had to do is show True. up one card. Your one card. The one card. I had that number memorized for years. <laughs> yeah. I think I still got mine. <laughs> my the number in my head. <laughs> All right. That is awesome. I think that's more of our most of the questions that we have here. So do we want to pick anyone? As a winner there, I'm going to kind of scroll through and make sure I didn't miss anybody, but I think that's all of them. I kind of like the the super sti- like the tradition question. That's always something we kind of talk about. All right. We at, we Where's at, that from? I believe we asked Brent and Vegan that at the media day last year, right? Like, what are your pregame Good traditions? Point. We did, yeah. So let's, let's pick that one. That was, scroll, 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 Nick Deal on Twitter. Woo! Yeah, Nick. All right. Thanks Nick. for the question, my Thanks man. Thanks for the question. That's right. We'll I will send you a golden coolie and a sticker. And a sticker. Yes. We are, yeah. you know, we send out the good care packages. 
Yeah. Man, my voice is getting Take a little hoarse. I can feel it. I've been talking for an hour and a half now. This is a marathon for us. This is a long one. Yep. Probably the longest we've ever had. <laughs> That's what she said. <laughs> I was going to avoid it the first time, but then you said <laughs> the longest we've ever had. Like, I can't. I can't. I'm sorry. All right, Michael Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't do it. All right. I think that about <laughs> tested then, man. Uh, we don't do predictions on here. So if you're looking for us to like make some sort of finalized, do the cats win? What's the score? We just, we don't do that. We're not going to do that. Is there anything else but you want to say about Cat Grizz uh, on this game? Oh, man. No, I, I love it. I hate it all at the same time. It gives me the nervous tummy, but I love it still. I love it. I love that game day is going to be there. And it's kind of a blessing in disguise. I guess a little bit less pressure than the game day is there, but they don't they don't televise the game. So there's still the normal yeah. amount of pressure on the actual viewing of it. There's just a lot of spotlight on it beforehand. But then, you know, I imagine most, most people who are watching game day aren't going to like stick around and then like, all right, well, I might as well watch this Cat Cruise game. I don't think that's really going to happen. So blessing in disguise, I guess. All right. Well, I'll wrap this up then. Thanks again for listening all year. We appreciate it. Thanks to everyone who purchased mm-hmm. a sweepstakes ticket. Um, this is Monday. We're, we're recording this. That will be announced. The winner will be announced on Thursday, 8 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, thanks to Manhattan Bank for being our dank sponsor all year. We really appreciate them. We're coming Bank on board Bank. this year. Thanks for all the Golden Cooley questions. Man, it's Cat Grizz fully. I think I'm going to end it here. This is the biggest Go Cats I'm going to give all year because I'm feeling good about it. Let's go Cats. Go Cats. Go Cats. Go Cats.